If, uh, if you're within about 10 years or maybe five years of age of me, and, and, and I'm 42, um, you may remember from your growing up experience in elementary school playing the organ trail. Who, who here ever went down the organ trail on an Apple II computer or something close to it? Yeah, uh, I, I love the organ trail. I, I'd look forward to computer time in class every week so I could go and play the organ trail. I specifically wanted to play the organ trail when it, this was about first, second, third grade, somewhere in that window. And if you haven't played it, the premise is pretty simple. You are a pioneer and you and your wagon train are setting out from Independence, Missouri for the Willamette Valley in Oregon. And it's the adventure along the way. You, you have a, a, a family that you create for yourself that travels with you. You, ha you can make up their names. I was in third grade when I was playing this. So my children on the wagon trains, their names were Fart and my daughter was Stink. And um, you took them and, and hopefully you made it there with everybody in your wagon train. And, and, and kids today, I got to tell you, you think that your hardcore video games like Call of Duty or, or uh, Grand Theft Auto are hardcore? I am telling you, just wait till you have to bury your daughter Stink on the shores of the, of the Klamath River or someplace on the Oregon Trail. That is intensity right there. So along the way in this computer game, you would encounter a lot of the challenges that the pioneers, it was educational, right? A lot of the challenges that the pioneers would meet along the way on the Oregon Trail. So you had to know how to get there wisely. You had to make sure that you packed enough food. And if you didn't pack enough food, you better have packed some ammo so you could go out and hunt bears and squirrels and buffalo. And if you, uh, you, you needed to make sure that you could fix your wagon if it broke down. And if you couldn't fix your wagon, you had better have packed some, uh, you know, some wagon wheels and tongues and axles and things like that for your wagon. It, all of this stuff was very important. And even if you did well, even if you made all the right cho choices, you might just come across some bad luck and, and maybe a, a robber would steal your supplies or maybe you uh, would have a member of the wagon party come down with cholera or dysentery. And we were kids. We didn't know what those things were. And then we learned what dysentery was, and, and we thought it was hilarious, even though it was a horrible illness and um, terrifying to have. But if you planned well and you made the right decisions, and maybe you had just a little bit of luck, then you and your family would make it to Oregon Territory, and you would show you, the, at the end of the game, you got this vision of this beautiful VGA graphics, barely two-dimensional homestead that you settled. But if you weren't so lucky, then you might not make it or you would lose people along the way. And I gotta say, for an 80s, educa 1980s educational uh, software with very basic two-dimensional graphics and, and so, much, so much that left you wanting, the Oregon Trail brought the idea of the pioneers to life, at least for me, I think for a lot of people. In fact, I've always loved the idea of being a pioneer, as long as I could sit safely at a computer desk and be that kind of pioneer. And I think the genesis of it goes back to playing the Oregon Trail, which of course is not like being one of the early pioneers, is it? They faced real dangers as they fanned out across the West when the country was still young. But over the years, long after I grew out of the old computer game, I've always been interested in the West and the people who went out to settle it and, of course, the people who had... Uh, it was news to them that, it, they ne that the land needed settling, the native people and the decisions they had to make that were often forced against them unjustly. Um, it would have been an unimaginably hard life for everybody in this region at, this, at, at that time because the West was a great wilderness. And it's easy to buy into the romantic notion of that. And I just love the idea of that. And I think that's kind of where we meet Jesus and the disciples in the text today. Because Jesus is starting his movement. He's chosen disciples. He's given them some instruction. And they've, they've traveled around with him a little bit and seen how he teaches and, and watched him do miracles and, and perform healings. And so then he partners them up. The text says two by two, Right? and says, okay, you've seen how I do my work, you've seen how I teach, you've even seen 
how I can do healings and miraculous things. Now you go out and do it. And then he sends them out like pioneers to share his message. And what's more, he says that he gives them authority to do so. He says, teach and heal and proclaim. I am empowering you to do those things in my name, which I think is very important. If you're wondering why Jesus tells the disciples, don't take food with you. That's weird, right? Don't take food on a long trip. But he says, don't take food with you. Don't take supplies. Uh, don't take extra clothes or, or things. Just take the staff that you're going to walk with and uh, that's weird to me because if they were merchants, they would bring supplies. There were other teachers that traveling around, Greek philosophers and such, who would bring things with them. But in first century Judean speak, what Jesus is saying is act like a teacher of Israel. When you come to the to a town or a village, act with authority and trust that people will respond and, and respond with hospitality. And if they don't, don't worry about it. Just move on. Don't let it trouble you. But maybe most, of, uh, most amazing of all is these disciples. And let me just point out, these disciples are kids. Okay? They, when Jesus meets them, very often they are apprenticing with their fathers, learning family trades like fishing or, you know, some of them are tax collectors or things like that. They're young. They are 13, 14, 15 years old when Jesus is talking to him, most of them anyway. And what's so amazing to me is they do it. They do what Jesus challenges them to do. And they go out and they do teach. And they do heal. And they're young. I mean, maybe they don't do it well all the time. Maybe they don't always do it gracefully, but they do it. And, and there must have been times when they were scared. They're, or they were rejected in a town and felt discouraged, but, but they do it because they're pioneers. And that's what pioneers do. They go out into the unknown. And in, in the case of the disciples, they follow their rabbi. You know, we are, we are followers of a pioneer faith. We are rarely at our best, and sometimes we're at our worst when we do our Christian thing inside the safety of nice thick walls. That's just a fact. We're rarely at our best and oftentimes we're at our worst when we do the work of faith in the safety of, of big walls. When Jesus is in the temple, things don't grow great for him. That's where he meets some of his stiffest opposition. When he goes to Jerusalem, the capital, the, the seat of the establishment, his ministry lasts about a week and then they kill him for it. We're at our best in the way of Jesus when we are out in the hinterlands, when we are out in the, whatever our equivalent is of the Galilee, little periphery places, small villages and towns where people who are outsiders are the people that we are meeting. That is our frontier and that's where we're at our best. And that's true not just for us as Jesus people, but also for us as Methodists. You know, John Wesley, he starts out, and early on, you know where he would preach? In nice classical Anglican churches, because he was a nice classical Anglican priest. And he does fine, it's, it's okay, but ultimately, his words, early on, fall very flat. But for an Anglican priest, church was where you preached. That's where the word of God was to be proclaimed. And it was familiar territory for Wesley. But there's another early Methodist, and we don't talk about him enough. His name was George Whitfield. And George Whitfield was one of those early Methodists that was working with Wesley. But it's also worth mentioning he was probably the best known preacher in the 18th century. Maybe one of the best known preachers ever. I think... If you think back on, on Billy Graham in the 20th century, George Whitfield may have been bigger than Billy Graham in the 18th century. That's not an exaggeration. And Whitfield, although he himself was a priest, didn't preach as much in the churches. He would preach in the town square and in the fields and by the sides of highways. And there when he would preach, and he was a fiery preacher, but but because it was such a public space, he would draw hundreds and indeed thousands of people when he would preach. And he was always writing Wesley, his friend, saying, you got to get out of the churches and come preach in the fields. So finally, Wesley does it. And I, this is, 
bless his poor little heart, John Wesley. This is my favorite thing maybe that he ever writes. It's on the, uh, apparently on the, one of the first days that he decides to do field preaching. This is what he says about it in his journal. I submitted to be more vile <laughs> and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation. I love that. That's the most vile thing he could think to do was to preach not in a sanctuary. Bless his poor little heart, but, but that's where Wesley's message, it becomes lightning in a bottle, only he lets it out of the bottle because he goes to the frontiers. But it was hard for him. He didn't want to do it. He wanted to stay where he was comfortable. It's hard being a pioneer. You know, those uh, pioneers, it's not always easy going when you're a pioneer. Usually it's, it's way harder than you imagine it's going to be. It would have been a much easier life for the pioneers in our own country to just stay back east where it was comfortable and there were kind of known futures out there for people. To, to, to be a pioneer was to buy into risk and uncertainty. One of my favorite stories of the pioneers is that of Charles Proust. Anyone heard of Charles Proust? Probably not. Charles Proust was the cartographer, the map maker for the John Fremont expedition. And Fremont was everything you would want in a pioneer. He was a soldier and a frontiersman, just like the embodiment of the American spirit. And Fremont and his partner, Kit Carson, uh, explored much of the American West, including the parts that we would pretend to be pioneers in, in the uh, Oregon Trail game, including parts of this state, in especially northern New Mexico. And they scouted areas all across the place, but Charles Proust was his map maker who would record where they went. And Proust was everything that Fremont was not. He was German, he was kind of stuffy European, and he did not like roughing it. He was not up for camping. Probably chose the wrong profession to go out and map uncharted territories, but, you know, not everybody makes great decisions in life. So... Uh, but he was this person who wanted the creature comforts, who didn't like having to go without a bed to sleep in, or, or who missed it when there weren't taverns to go and have a beer and talk with people. But he had a job to do, to make the maps of the expeditions. And Proust kept a journal, as did Fremont, by the way, and their journals read very, very differently if you read them side by side. Proust's does not exactly ooze the adventurous spirit. So... Um, on one occasion, when Fremont is writing about the glory of, of the unknown, Proust's journal reads, I wish I were at a market with a shopping cart today. <laughs> or on another ex uh, occasion, as he discusses the expedition's prairie dinner of roast mule, Proust laments, laments, what a treat it would be to have a bottle of wine, but oh, stop, that thought is too beautiful to dwell upon. <laughs> Fremont and Proust were quite an odd couple. Fremont was nationally known uh, by his nickname, the Pathfinder. His most iconic moment when he climbed, he said to the top, who knows, you know, egos and such, but he said that he climbed to the top by himself what he thought was the tallest peak in the Rockies. Now, we know it wasn't the tallest peak, but it was a darn tall peak. And what he says is that he climbs to the top and he pulled out of his pack. It was that dramatic. He pulled out of his pack an American flag and he planted it on the top of the mountain. And like the good soldier he was, and this, they should, this should be a scene in a movie, he salutes the flag and then he walks back down the mountain. I mean, he was unapologetically grand. Proust's entry from the same day that Fremont climbed that mountain and saluted and all that stuff, it, lead, it reads a lot less like Neil Armstrong and a little bit more like Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> Here's what Proust did that day. Today I slipped in snow and slid on my pants a great speed for 200 feet until a bare rock stopped my descent. Rolling over twice, I limped away with a bruise on my right arm and another on my, and if you can imagine a word for your posterior, that's what he wrote that we'd never say in church. Fremont's journal from that day finishes like this. Standing where no human foot ever stood before, I felt the exultation of the first explorers. Like, wow, that's good, right? You can sell books that way. Proust's uh, journal entry that day, it ends like this. Oh, and I have torn my pants. 
Most of Proust's journal entries involve various flip-outs about uh, lack of food or the kind of food they were eating, and especially that there was no salts to, to flavor the food with. In one journal entry from 1842, he celebrates that the expedition traded with some natives for a big bag of rock salt, and, and he spends a few pages talking about how much he's looking forward to eating a, a well-seasoned meal and how good it's going to be. He writes so much, in fact, that he forgets the other little um, achievement that the party had that day. They discovered Lake Tahoe that day, and he doesn't even, it doesn't come up. <laughs> but here's the thing. Proust may read like the quintessential whiner, but his journals were actually really only written for his wife to read after the expedition. He never wanted people to see them. And indeed, nobody did until somebody found them in the 1950s and published them. Um, in fact, no one on the, in, on the expedition ever even knew that Proust was unhappy. In Proust's journal, he frequently, or excuse me, in Fremont's journal, he frequently compliments Proust's uh, outstanding map making and even compliments the cartographer for his sunny disposition and cheeriness, especially in low moments when the, when the uh, rest of the expedition was downtrodden. Because here's the other thing about Germans, they have a job to do and by God they're going to get it done. I mean the fact is God calls us to mission and I'm just here to tell you it's rarely in a comfortable place. It's rarely in the place we would want it to be. Sometimes it's not even cheery. Um, we have to go deeper and farther than that if we're going to be pioneers. Mike Slaughter, who founded Ginghamsburg Church, a large United Methodist church in Ohio, he, he, he wrote a book where he said, you know, I started thinking about founding Ginghamsburg because when I looked at the local church, it didn't look very much like a pioneer expedition. It didn't seem like a wagon train. What the local church seemed like to me was a cruise ship. A cruise ship is self-contained, and it's a fortress of programming for every age and interest. It is intensely planned and organized. People choose a cruise for the experience of vacation and retreat, Slaughter writes. You are fed, pampered, massaged, and more from a seemingly endless menu of activities. If you want to lie on a beach, you can do that on a cruise ship. If you want to explore the interior of a tropical island, you can do that. You can go snorkeling and see a plethora of tropical fish or go golfing. If you want, you don't even need to leave the boat. Many churches, Slaughter writes, present themselves the same way. A wide variety of activities and interest groups for every member of every shape of every size. Come to church and find everything you could want. And so the customers become the focus. Sometimes I think his comparison is even more literal than I would want it to be. I was at a conference a few years ago. It was on young people's ministries, young adults, down through children, um, including youth. And one of the main presenters was the president of a company who, I kid you not, uh, was selling mission trip cruises. Well, that's way closer to Mike Slaughter's observation than you want it to be. You bring a bunch of your, of your teenagers and put them on a cruise ship for six, and, six or seven days, and two of those days they would stop and get off the boat and do mission work in the morning and go to the beach in the afternoon. And that was your mission trip, to expand horizons and serve the poor. It's crazy. I mean, at what point do we in the church stop thinking of ourselves? What point did we stop thinking of ourselves as a wagon train, working together for common purpose, and instead as members who get the benefits of membership? We're sent by Jesus. We learned this a couple weeks ago at Gather. We heard from various uh, community formers, community organizers, that church can be anywhere. Church can be at home. Church can be in bars. Church can be out in the wild. Church can be what happens when you're hiking through the mountains. Church can be what happens when you gather any community together where God is needed. That's church. It can happen whether you're in small groups, whether you're serving others, whether you are partnering with other community organizations and, and magnifying the good work that they are doing, even here in these walls, what if we measured success by what's happening here that we as, as the church people don't have much to do with? What if we measured success by how many times each week is Mandy's farm meeting here and helping people with different abilities? Requires. You know who's a great community organizer? Matt Greer. 
He is. Not just here at St. John's, but with, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask for anything big this week, but I am going to puff you up a little bit. Um, <laughs> Quintessence is a community of singers. And that's like one of, how many, how many things do you do, Matt? Jeez, you make us look bad, but you make us look great. Out there building community, that's the pioneer spirit. What if we measured our success as a church that way instead of how many people are in the pews on Sunday? And let me leave with this. Um, And I just want to plant a seed in your um, heart and also maybe in your schedule. Uh, Because a few weeks ago also at Gather, we got to meet some of the folks in southeast New Mexico. Now, uh, they were not planning on being pioneers, but their United Methodist Church left... um, their church in Hobbs or Carlsbad or Artesia or a few other places, Clovis. And we invited them here for gather. Uh, By the way, what they did was hard, like pioneer work. But they said, and this is their words, not mine, we were not going to leave to start some new church if that new church was founded on the idea of excluding people more than we were before. We want to be part of a church that brings more people in, that, that includes people that others shun. What a crazy idea. So here's what I want to suggest. They were good enough to come up here for a few days. What if we were pioneering to go down and see them too? And so I'm asking folks to look at their schedules for late February, early March. We'll have a date set by the end of this week, in fact, um, to take a weekend and go down to Hobbs or Carlsbad. I, I, uh, you know, the smallest town I ever lived in was Las Cruces, about 90,000 people. Hobbs or Carlsbad seem like the frontier to me. And, um, but it's a great frontier full of beautiful people who want a big-hearted, inclusive church in southeast New Mexico. And I can go, but y- you know what the problem is there. I'm Josh Corey, local Jesus salesman. This is my trade. <laughs> if we had people, real people like you, come... It would be heartfelt. So I'm giving you the invitation. Let's go down to Hobbs. Let's go down to Artesia. It'll smell a little oily there, but that's actually really just the smell of money is what they tell me. So that's coming. But we need to do that because we follow a Savior who calls us to go. We follow a Savior who Scripture describes as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. What that tells me is that the perfecting part of our faith happens when we walk outside those doors and we put ourselves out there and make ourselves vulnerable. So maybe we all need to be um, a little more Wesleyan and be a little more vile and go out there and do vile things like pioneers. So let us pray. Gracious God, fill us with your spirit. We've had plenty of time to prepare, just like the disciples, and and so we just pray that you would send us, uh, send us two by two or in groups and with friends to serve and to heal. Send us out with authority. Amen. I think I just gave the invitation to, to Christian discipleship. I'm, I'm going to be honest. If, if you feel called to live more deeply um, following Jesus in your life, if you're willing to take risks for that, I actually believe you're sitting in the, in the perfect church for that. I, I think that this is a great place to, um, to do daring things and pioneering things. And if that's you, then I'd invite you to speak with some, uh, either me or Matt or any member of this church or our staff about how we can all do that better together and how you can be a part of this church as we seek to all be pioneers together.